Hello everyone, it's Benny, and welcome to the companion video for Meshes and Vertices. In this video, I'm going to discuss a few other ways you might consider sending mesh data to the GPU, because there aren't just VBOs, in fact, there's four common methods of doing it. And I'm going to discuss the pros and cons of each, and hopefully help you decide if the method I showed you, VBOs, is really the method that's ideal for you. So, with that out of the way, let's go ahead and get started. So, the first method I want to discuss is immediate mode. And the thing about immediate mode is, it's a very easy and intuitive way of creating meshes. It works kind of like playing connect the dots. You'll give it a bunch of points, like with GeoVertex, and then in the GL begin parameter, you'll tell it how you want it to connect those dots. Like, hey, open GL, I want you to draw a bunch of lines between all these dots, or hey, I want you to draw a bunch of lines and then completely fill it in. So yeah, it's literally playing connect the dots with fancy graphics hardware. And that's why people like it so much. It's pretty easy, pretty straightforward, and it's really good because it's hard to screw up. And that's immediate mode, for the most part. That's what's really good about it. But immediate mode may not be the best choice in all cases, and here's why. In graphics programming, there's really four big bottlenecks that you want to be aware of. And they are the CPU, the bus connecting the CPU and GPU, and inside the GPU itself, there's vertex processing and pixel-based processing. And those are really your four big bottlenecks. Now, the ones I really think you should be aware of right now is the bottleneck of the CPU and the bus. Because something a lot of people really don't seem to understand is just the sort of difference between the, C the way the CPU processes data and the way the GPU processes data. It's kind of like comparing a Segway to a, some sort of sonic jet, because even if you had some super fancy 10 gigahertz processor with 16 cores and, and su su liquid cooling, superconducting, whatever other fancy features you want to add to it, it would still be light years behind your GPU in terms of performance, at least in graphics operations. Because your GPU is very highly specialized to do graphics processing in ridiculously fast. And that's why even if you're using the supposedly crappy Intel integrated 3000 graphics card, you'll still want to use that over the CPU, even if you had a really fancy CPU, because it's so specialized. And the whole point I'm trying to get at right here is, even though vertex functions and pixel functions can bottleneck the GPU if you do a bunch of absolutely ridiculous calculations in them, like if you want to do parallax occlusion mapping and combine it with a whole bunch of fancy e shadow volumes, or insert whatever ridiculous functions you want there. That's how that bottleneck works. But CPU and bus, that's where it's really, really easy to bottleneck, because there's such a huge contrast in performance difference there. And all you have c connecting these two vastly different performing things is this one tiny bus. That's why it's so easy to bottleneck your whole graphics pro processing pipeline with the CPU and the bus. Because once you do that, I mean, if the CPU is a Segway and the GPU is the Sonic Jet, that's like having the Sonic Jet wait at the airport, waiting for this big, fat security guard to slowly roll up on the Segway, and, you know, that just makes everyone unhappy. And the reason I'm really bringing this up so much is that is where immediate mode fails. You see, if you want to create something with immediate mode, in terms of, like, the way it works on the hardware, it looks kind of like this, if my graphics image will turn on. There we go. You have all this data coming from the CPU, and it'll sort of go along the bus to the GPU, one at a time, haphazardly, all over the place. And the weird curvatures and lines are intentional, because they it does get really a bit um, congested on the bus. There's a lot of data that's coming from all over the place. You're, you're going to get tons of bus bottlenecks if you use immediate mode. And furthermore, every time you want to specify some new vertex, 
the GPU has to wait for, for the CPU to specify it. So it's like every time you want to take off in the jet, you have to wait for the big fat guy on the Segway to slowly roll up with the next passenger. Then you can take off, and then you're waiting for the next fat guy to roll up slowly with the next passenger. And, you, you know, it's kind of like that. So that's where immediate mode fails. It makes the GPU not only wait for the CPU, but it can also con easily congest the bus with a whole lot of information. So, immediate mode, if you're doing something simple, I wouldn't worry about it. If you're drawing, you know, a square, because you just need to get some image displayed on the screen, you need a square, go for it. It's not going to make it really much of a difference at that point. But if you're doing anything much more complex than that, you might want to consider another method, because it, it gets really easy to bottleneck the CPU and the bus with that. So, that's immediate mode. It's great for its ease of use, but it's it really falters when you you want to have a whole bunch of more complicated meshes. For simple meshes, it's great though. So that's immediate mode. The next method is the vertex array, and in terms of the way you actually use this, this is a lot like immediate mode. You're still doing the sort of connect the dots things. You're specifying a whole bunch of different points, and then you're telling OpenGL some way to connect those points, whether it be lines, triangles, squares, squoctagons, whatever ridiculous shape you want to think of. And so it does keep a lot of the ease of use of immediate mode, but the difference is, rather than sending all the vert points one at a time with GL vertex, you'll combine them all into one giant array of vertices, one giant list, and then you'll just draw them all at once with the GL draw arrays method. And the big advantage to this, if I bring up my sort of reference image, is rather than sending the data one at a time from all over the place, you're sending the data all at once and sending it straight to the GPU from a whole very organized location. If we go back to the previous example of the Segway and the Sonic Jet, it's kind of like rather th than sending every passenger to the jet one at a time, slowly with the Segway, it's kind of like saying, okay, all the passengers report to, to flight 95 or whatever, you know, sending everyone all at once. And furthermore, it's like having all the passengers in one location rather than having them, okay, let's go collect all the passengers from all over the airport. So, two big advantages. And that's sort of the, the way you can think of it. If you want a more literal way of what it does, it's really just alleviating the CPU time, because you don't have to manually send all the data at once with the CPU. The CPU can say, okay, send once, move on to other tasks. So this really alleviates the CPU bottleneck. You don't have to worry about that as much. Now, busing is a different story. Since you're, although you do have the advantage that you're sending the data from a very contingu contiguous location, so you don't have to worry about data coming from all over the place, now you're sending the data all at once. So in some cases, this can actually make the bus bottleneck even worse than before. But the big advantage, again, is it alleviates a whole bunch of CPU time. So if you're spending a whole bunch of processing on AI and physics and other complex calculations, vertex arrays are going to give you a huge boost in performance over immediate mode because they're giving you a whole bunch more of that CPU time to work on those AI and physics and such. And you don't have to spend so much time calculating, well, I guess it's not really calculating, but sending data to the GPU. Although, again, the disadvantage to that whole system is, the really big one is the bus. Because you have a lot more data, and yeah. So that's really the vertex array. Its advantage is it still keeps a lot of the ease of use of the immediate mode. Not all of it. It's not as intuitive to think of, okay, there's this huge contiguous list of numbers, and every three sets of numbers represents a point, and you know what I'm saying? So, yeah, it's not quite as intuitive, but it keeps a fair bit of the ease of use, and it saves you a whole bunch of CPU time. That is a vertex array. So, the next method is the display list. And the way the display list works is you'll create a new list, and then you'll draw however you want in the list. 
So you can use immediate mode and just draw something really easily, or you can use vertex arrays if you prefer, or you can use pretty much any method of drawing the data you want. So you still get that really big ease of use factor if you really want it. And th that's one of the really good things about display lists. But here's the thing, once it takes this list, it stores it on the GPU, and then it's done. No more CPU or busing involved, other than, of course, the CPU saying, hey, GPU, I need you to draw this list now. So it almost, com it pretty much completely eliminates the CPU busing factor in entirely. If this is, this, in almost every implementation, not every implementation, but almost every driver implementation of display list, this is the fastest way of storing data on the GPU. In our Segway example, it's like having all the passengers already on the jet. How can there be a bottleneck if you don't even need to move the passengers in the first place? They're already there, you know? So, yeah. If you want the image, it looks kind of like this. You'll have the big display list. You'll have all your data, your immediate data, your vertex array data, however you want to put the data in there. And the cool thing is, most drivers well, pretty much all drivers nowadays, they'll actually go in and optimize the display list to make it draw even faster than before. So, not only do you get rid of the CPU and busing bottleneck, 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 you also get a whole bunch of free mesh optimization along with it. So, yeah, display lists are really, really good for performance. And, yeah, so you might be wondering at this point, well, display lists, they have the ease of use, they're the, pretty much the fastest way. What's the catch? What's the big disadvantage to display list? What makes them bad? Why, why, would, why wouldn't everyone use display lists? And well, here's the big catch with display lists. And yeah, it's a pretty big catch. Once you take all this data, you've drawn all the points, you've drawn all your triangles, whatever shape you want to draw, you store it on the GPU, you know, now I want to move it. I want to move it over or up or something. How do I do that? Exactly. Once the data's there, it doesn't provide you a good method of changing anything. With immediate mode, if I wanted to change something, I'd just say, oh, now this time I'm going to draw the points you know, in a different place. Or vertex arrays, I'm going to specify a different array which has the points in a different place. Display lists, you know, you're not going to be able to do that very easily. If you want to really do that, the best way in a lot of cases is just specifying a completely new list. And, well, then that sort of defeats the whole point, because then you have to do the CPU generation of the list and busing, and then you're back to square one with display lists, isn't it? And even worse, because now you have to do a bunch of memory allocation stuff. So yeah, that's the big catch with display lists. But, and the other sort of catch is they do are using some um, GPU memory, and they actually use a pretty decent amount of memory, so... Although, I mean, again, if you're using something simple, it's not going to matter too much, but if you're storing 2 million polygons in a display list, you might run into a memory issue. But, yeah. So that's display lists. They have the advantage of being easy to use, and they pretty much eliminate the CPU and busing bottleneck. But the disadvantage is, once you have the data there, you can't really change it all that much. And that brings us to our final method. The vertex buffer object, or VBO. And a vertex buffer object is in a lot of ways, just a display list of a vertex array. You'll create the vertex array, you'll store it somewhere on the GPU, and then you can draw from that array. So you've eliminated the CPU and busing bottleneck, you have a lot of the ease of use of using the vertex array, even though it's not quite as easy as immediate mode. And yeah, so you might be wondering, well, what's the advantage to that? How is that any different from just creating a display list? And here's how. This is sort of how the vertex buffer object is stored in memory. You have all the data, and then it just has it there on the GPU, of course, for the processor. But what's different is, one, it doesn't necessarily do all that optimization. It gives you a very distinct location to store contiguous memory, like a vertex array. And therefore, the vertex buffer object gives you lots of power to actually go in and change the data 
even so you don't have that big disadvantage of the display list you have all the data being drawn on not only with a lot of the speed of the display list it's usually not quite as fast as the display list but you get most of the speed and on top of that you can go in and change the data really easily so that's the vertex buffer object it's a lot it's kind of like if you had that big giant jet with all the passengers but you had some mechanism so kind of like an ejection seat so you could just eject out one passenger just pop pop in another if if you want to think of it like that it's it just gives you it's a lot like a display list of a vertex array but it makes it really easy to go in and change the data if you really want to and still keep most of the performance so from technical end, it almost eliminates the CPU and busing bottleneck, so you don't have to worry about that too much. And it still uses some GPU memory. It doesn't use as much memory as a display list, but it still uses some amount of GPU memory, so that, that may be a consideration for you. It's not quite as fast as a display list, so that's also another consideration. But yeah, other than that, vertex buffer objects are mostly the way to go. So, you might be wondering, well, why don't you always use vertex buffer objects? And that's what a lot of people do. Most of these other methods are officially marked as deprecated. But they all have their advantages. Vertex buffer objects, they're not as easy to use as other methods like immediate mode. It's probably easier to make a mistake creating a vertex buffer object than it is to make a mistake specifying points with immediate mode. Something like VBO, it's not quite as fast as a display list. If you want absolute best performance, you're going to want to use a display list. Even, even though you won't be able to change all the data, it's still going to be able to draw a lot faster than a vertex buffer object, in most cases. And yeah, so those are all the different ways of drawing meshes. Well, they are definitely not all the different ways. Those are the big ways of drawing meshes. There's plenty of really creative ways of drawing meshes. Like, for example, you could s draw, send mesh data to the GPU with a texture. You could have each individual color, rather than having an RGB value, the RGB components are actually the X, Y, and Z components of a, a vector, and you construct a mesh out of that, for, for example. Another way you sometimes do it is, if you're sending a particularly large object to the GPU, sometimes what you do is you'll just send some data to the GPU, and you use that data to generate the mesh that's stored on the GPU, rather than creating the mesh on the CPU, and that can be a lot faster in some cases, or you can just have it generate the mesh every single frame. And that can have, that can be really interesting. There's plenty of exotic ways of creating meshes, but these are the big ones. So hopefully you understand why I ended up going with VBOs, but hopefully you also understand that VBOs aren't the ultimate end of g generating meshes. They're pretty good for most scenarios, but they definitely aren't the ultimate solution. And hopefully, if you Hopefully you know enough now to decide if the other methods are actually better for you than VBOs, because, you know, they're not the ultimate solution. They're a good solution, but they're definitely not the best solution, especially not in all cases. So yeah, hope you enjoyed, hope you learned, and that's Mesh Data. See you next time.